So I'm going to show you how we can speed up our workflow using Python to build motion capture sequences and then character extensions to correct all the prop interactions. And then finally, how we can use Motion Builder Story Tool to create that matrix slow motion effect. So in one of the first videos that we did, we looked at building the opening sequence for the lobby shootout in Motion Builder Story Tool. I'll leave a link in the description below. So there we were manually adding characters and environments and props, and then adding in cameras, reference cameras, and shot cameras, which took us about 20 minutes, which is fine if you've only got one or two shots to do. But if you're working in a studio or you've got a lot of these kind of shots to do, then you're going to need a faster and easy way to do that. And this is where Motion Builder Python can come to the rescue. Now, I'm not going to explain line by line how the script works, but I will give you a sort of overview of what I'm actually doing. So you can see here we've got four dictionaries. So the first one here sets up the characters and a file path to the characters. The second one does the same for props. So we've got the prop names and then a path to the props. And then we've got another dictionary here. So this is we're going to use this to set up all the scene settings, so all the transport controls. So this tells Motion Builder where the file is that we're going to load. And then in here we can set all the transport control settings. And then the final dictionary contains our scene setup. So in here we've got our scene ID, then we've got our characters, and then the props that they're holding, and then which hand they're holding it in. I'll come back to why later. So now all I need to do is run this script, and this is going to build this scene much faster than you could do this manually. And the other advantage is you could give this to a motion editor or an animator that may not necessarily know exactly how Motion Builder works or what all these settings are, or to make sure that all these settings are set up correctly. They can just run this script and then it's going to build the scene for them. Or you could even give it to somebody that's never used Motion Builder before if you need somebody just to build all these scenes and then hand them to animators so all they've got to do is open up the scenes and start working. So you can see once the script's finished, it's set up all our transport controls. So it's set the take name, we've got our loop playback set, we've got our playback speed set, frames per second, which we are going to change later but I'll explain why then. Then we've got our snap mode set to snap and play on frames. We've got our, the frame range set for the video file that we're going to be using. And then if we come down here into the scene browser, you can see we've added in our lobby scene. And then we've added all our characters in. And they've all got their own namespace. And then when we've got multiple characters with the same name, it's incremented each one of those. Then we've also got all the props that they're going to be using in the same namespace. And then down at the bottom here, you can see we've created a camera route. So this is where we're going to add all our cameras. So the first one, if we close that and come into cameras, you can see we've created a video reference camera. So if we right click and make this camera current, we can see in here we've created a video reference camera and then we've set the video reference file onto the front plate. So now if we play this back we can see we've got our video reference playing back at the correct frame rate which is 25 frames a second and it's set to the frame range that we want to use for this sequence. We've also added a HUD to this so what this does is it just adds some more information into the actual camera view. So you can see we've got our camera name, we've got the take name and then we've also got the current frame that we're on. Speaking of cameras, there is another bit of the script here. So what this is going to do is if we run this, so this creates a shot cam. So these have exactly the same settings as the shot cameras that we built before that I was doing manually, but now obviously it's much faster. I can get the script to set all the settings that we had. So I don't have to go in and manually change the rotation orders or the different camera settings. So if we come into here, we can see we've already set up all the ratios and everything. And we've given it a default lens. And then the same as our video reference camera, we've also given it a HUD, so a head-up display. So this just shows you the current frame rate of the scene, the current camera focal length, the field of view, and its focal distance. And then same as the video reference camera, it's got a camera name, take name, and then the current frame. And obviously all this information updates. So you can see the frame number changes. And then if we come down here, if we change this focal length to 27, you can see that gets updated up here. And then if we change the frames per second to 30, you can see that's also updated. So all this information updates dynamically, so it means you always know what settings you've got on the current camera, you know what camera you're looking through, and then what the settings are for the scene and the camera. The other thing that the script does is it puts it into this incremental namespace, so if we add another camera, so as you can see here, it's created this incremental camera namespace, so this will go up each time we add a camera, and also it makes a camera the current view in the viewport. And then finally, we've got our characters all set up in here in a namespace again. And then we've also given them all a character extension for the props. I'll come back to more on why and what these do later. And then last but not least, if we come into our editing layout, 
and just go back into a perspective camera, you can see here in story, the last thing the script does is it adds all our characters into story, ready for all that lovely mocap. So now we've got our scene all blocked out with the animation, ignore the lack of props or badly positioned props in these shots, we'll fix those later. And you see here we've got all our animation, our characters are in position, ready to go. Now something that has changed this time is you'll see the frame rates changed, either up here in the viewport or down here on the transport controls. So originally we were at 25 frames a second so that we could match the frame range in our video reference file for this sequence. But now we want to start scaling some of these, we're going to switch to 120 frames a second. So the reason for 120 frames a second is, if we just look at one of the clips that we've got where we hit the wall, you can see here, if we look at this, this is the MBN export, if we look at this, we can see here, this is actually captured at 240 frames a second. So if I switch this to custom and then set it to 240 frames, you can see here there's 240 frames every for every second of animation. But because we're going to scale this down probably no more than half, we don't actually need all those keyframes and it can make your scene more difficult to work with. So what I've actually done here is if we look at our character, you can see I've resampled these at 120 frames a second. So that just means, if we switch to 120, that just means we're only skipping every other frame. So we're keeping a lot of this detail that we've already got in here. So the reason we don't drop to 30 frames a second, if we just compare here, so this I've reset to 30 frames a second. If we just look at his head where he impacts this wall and compare these two graphs for Z and switch this to 30 frames a second, you can see now we're actually losing four frames of detail. So you can see here it starts to affect the shape of the curve so it starts to get a lot smoother. So if we look at this here you can see at 120 frames a second you've got this sort of double bounce here but on our 30 frames a second you can see it start to smooth it out because you just don't have that detail of this keyframe here because it goes from here to here you're missing this sort of keyframe that's going to put you this bend in here. What happens then is if you start taking this data and then you start scaling this out, what starts to happen is this curve starts getting very flat and goes very smooth, so you're losing a lot of the detail. It makes the animation start to look quite swimmy. So if we just go back to our 120 frames a second and then compare the head on that, we can see here at 120 frames a second we've still got that curve that matches the original and that sort of double bounce effect here. So by resampling everything to 120 frames a second, it helps us keep all that detail and texture from the original capture, and it also helps keep our scenes manageable. So one of the advantages of using Motion Builder is it's actually built for working with this kind of dense keyframe data that you get from motion capture systems. So if we come up here into display, we can get a head up display and do display rate or shift F. And up here you can see we've got our frame rate playing back. So if you're a Maya user, you might want to look away now because if we play this back, you can see now we've got 16 seconds of animation plotted at 120 frames a second on six different characters and we're still getting over 30, 35 frames a second playback which means I very rarely have to render something out. You can just look at it in the viewport, adjust something, play it again, adjust something, play it again. You don't have to keep waiting for it to render something out. So to rescale a clip we're going to be working on this clip here where he runs in and bangs into the wall and then drops to his knee. So if we compare this to our video reference, you can see here we're doing a lot more steps than he is in the video. So we need to slow this down. So to do that, there's a couple of options. First one is we can just slide this clip along because we need to make a bit of space. And then in here we can change the loop scale clips to scale. And then if we focus in on that. We can just drag this out and you can see here the values actually change so you can see how much you're scaling the clip down. So if we do a quarter speed, so now you can see we're doing a lot less steps, so we're only getting one step and then hits the wall and then drops down to the floor. So now if we play that back and compare it to our video reference, you can see it's matching a lot closer. So the other way we can change this is we can double click the clip and then change the speed. So in here we can change this to 0.75. So now that slowed the clip down, as you can see it doesn't match 
with our video reference. So if we take this, look at our video reference where he hits the wall here, we can grab our clip here, and then we're just going to slide this along till we get to the same frame. And then making sure that we've put this back onto loop and scale clips, we can pull this clip back out to get more of the animation and take off some of the start. So now we've got our clip lined up, playing back at about the same speed as we had in our video. And then just in case you want a third way of doing this, we can also, with our clip selected, we can just come back over here into our clip properties. And then in here, we've got speed, and we can just change this to 0.75. And then do the same thing again. So because we've scaled our clip, it's not going to be in the right place. So you can look at where he's supposed to be hitting the wall. You can grab our clip and just move it along so it matches our video reference. And then trim our clip back to match. So then we can repeat the process for these other two clips that are in slow motion. So you can see here I've just slowed this one down by a half and then this one down by a half. And then when we play that back, you can see we've got our clips playing at full speed where they need to be. And then when it goes into this slow motion, we've got our slow motion clips playing back. And hopefully we've managed to keep all that detail. So the last thing we're going to look at is something that I mentioned back at the start that the script was doing, and that's character extensions. So character extensions allow you to add any object to your character ring. So this could be a wings and tail, or in our case, props. Now the handy thing about this is once you've created a character extension and added a prop, any poses that you create, gets in, the prop gets included in those poses. So this means when you paste a pose, not only does it align the character in the correct position, but it'll also align the prop into their hands. So remember these lads from the previous tutorial where we looked at how to fix two-handed prop animation? Well now we can use the work we've already done in this sequence to help create poses that will help fix all the other prop interactions in the rest of the shots where we've got a SWAT guy holding a gun, which in this lobby shootout sequence is a lot of shots. So to create a character extension, the first thing we're going to do is come into our character controls and we're going to work on our SWAT guy number one. So we're just going to select him and then make sure he's in full body and we're just going to put him in a T-pose. So then if we just, let's hide that lobby. And focus in on him. So now with our character in a T-pose, we can find his gun. And then we're just going to right click and zero that in translation and rotation to put it in the center. And then we can close that up. And then in our character, we're going to come to our, our number one SWAT guy and we're going to right click and create a character extension. And if we just double click on that. So in our character extension, we're actually going to come in here. We're going to grab the handle of the, we just come into double viewport. We just open up a second viewport, come into our schematic view. We find our character root one. We're going to grab the handle of that. And then we're just going to alt drag that into our character extension and add that to the swap character extension. So now if we double click that and come over here into properties, we can see in here what we're looking for is this reference object. Now if you're creating, if you're going to use a prop in the character extension, then you need to put in a reference object. So for this guy, we're just going to use his hand. So just before I select his hand, we're going to lock our properties panel so it doesn't change when we select it. We're going to select the hand and we're going to alt drag that into this reference object here. And then click OK. When you add a reference object, what you're doing is telling Motion Builder what part of the body this prop is associated with. So here we're saying it's associated to his right hand because that's the hand that he's holding it in, which is what we had in the script. So now Motion Builder knows when it creates a pose for the prop, it needs to set its position relative to its reference object. So this isn't like a constraint. This isn't going to move. So if you move his hand, the weapon doesn't move with his hand. It doesn't work like a constraint. It's, so this just tells Motion Builder which part of the body it needs to align the prop with when it pastes the pose. So now we've got this set up, we'll control one into a single view again, and then we just need to go to a frame where our character's holding the prop. So if we select our swap character one and hit F, so we can see which one he is. So you can see here we've got our swap guy one in a pose, and he's holding the gun. So now we can unlock the panel and come into pose controls. And then in here, we're gonna set a full body pose. We're gonna select our swap guy and we're just gonna create that pose. Now the handy thing about this is, if we come into a new take and we grab our character, if we put him back in a T pose at the center of the scene, we can see our character goes back to the center of the scene. But now if we paste this pose, so I'll leave match translation on, we'll turn match rotation off. I'll leave match translation on so he stays in this position. 
if we double click and paste that pose now you can see we get our character holding the weapon in the correct position and all the fingers are correct so even if we grab this prop and move it out the way you can see even if we paste that then it'll move him so we're now pasting relative to the gun but you can see it goes back into his hand so if we move this even if we move this over here select our character again it moves the gun back into his hand so what we need to do now is repeat the process to create all these poses and then if we check now we have our character we have our swap character set at zero and then if we just check these poses we can see we've got four different poses all with the weapons in the right position that we can go and apply in the rest of our scenes so now the same as we did before with Nigel and Tracy we can come down here into our navigator and if we come down to poses we can select our poses just shift D to make sure we've got nothing else selected we can select our poses and then we can come up here and we can do save selection and save these out as a separate file and then if we come back into our scene where we've got everything plotted onto our control rigs and then in here we can just come up and we're going to file merge the poses we've created and now we can just select our first swap guy and then in here I've just tidied up these poses a little bit so I've created a folder to keep them all in for swap poses and then in here I've just named them so that I know what they actually are what weapon they're holding and what position they're in so for this first swap guy we want one of the standing ones we're going to put him in full body because we want to paste it to the full body including the prop now because we've got our character extensions so you can paste that and then we can set a full body key and come to our second guy and this is one of the kneeling ones we can just find one that fits for that one and then key that so as you can see we can apply these poses to the different SWAT guys which will fix the poses and the hands on the weapon and then we can just tweak those slightly just to get a slight variation so what we have to do now is repeat the process on the rest of the SWAT team in this sequence and then all the other sequences in this lobby shootout which obviously is going to save us a ton of time and work so now we have a script that's going to help us build all our scenes and we have a set of poses that are going to help correct all the weapon interactions. The next thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to run up a wall. So to see how we're going to do that, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, I'd like to thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.